um, carbon and oxygen isotope ties are not unique. You can see that we have a positive spike and negative spike several, at several places in, on that curve. But what's interesting is that the spike combined together offer a very robust way to basically recognize those isotopic events in your own sediments. And because these events are well dated, you can use them as chronostratigraphic markers. Now, carbon and oxygen are not the only two isotopes we can use for that. We can also use something very commonly used, which is strontium isotopes. So I'm showing you here a compilation of strontium isotope values of the ocean over the last 500 million years. And that was put together by Gratstein. And the point to see is that we have peaks and troughs and general trends in strontium isotope. Now, strontium isotope refers to the isotope of strontium 87 over the isotope of strontium 86. And the isotope of strontium 87 tend to be associated with the decay of rubidium and with erosion of um, crystalline basement, so more with mountain building, whereas strontium-86 actually comes from a completely different source. It comes from basalts, and it's often associated with uh, mid-ocean ridges, basalts, and hydrothermal activities. And the point is, you can see that on the long term, there are episodes where we have peaks in 87 over 86 strontium. That re represents episode of orogeny, of mountain buildings. And we have trough in 87 over 86 strontium that represents increased hydrothermal activity. And we can use these to basically determine different um, times on that curve. And you can see that the uplift of the Himalayas starting at 60 million years generated, for instance, a very strong shift of strontium isotope towards much heavier values um, today. So in practical terms, the way you would use strontium isotope is you would look at the absolute value of strontium in one section, and you try to correlate that value to the absolute value on the second section or section B. So it's really looking at the absolute value of strontium isotope here that allows you to do the uh, correlation. Again, each one of these uh, chemostratigraphic tool on its own has flaws. It's not easy to use because these values or these peaks may not be unique. So what we tend to do in stratigraphy is to combine multiple methods, combine multiple um, tracers. And strontium isotope and carbon isotopes and oxygen isotope can be combined together to basically solve problems in stratigraphy. And I'm going to show you now one example of our own work in the United Arab Emirates. So here you see the succession of limestone from the Musandam Peninsula in the United Arab Emirates. Now these were deposited on, an, on a shallow epiric sea, and we'll talk about carbonates more in our next lecture. But notice the red arrow here pointing to the scale. This is 60 meters. So this is a, a sizable package of carbonates. The problem is because these carbonates were deposited in shallow water, it's actually hard to know at what time they were deposited because most of the good biostratigraphic markers are pelagic organisms. So we find a few ammonites, but not many. And we know that there is in this package of rocks somewhere the Jurassic Triassic boundary. So the, the, the Triassic to Jurassic boundary is somewhere here. This is not from previous work based on ammonite classification, for instance, but there's very, very poor indication of exactly where in a window of 100 to 200 meters exactly that boundary lies. And so what we tried to do was to apply geochemical methods to narrow down where exactly this boundary should be. And my former PhD student, Martin Hoenig, did this work by collecting some shells from um, different kinds of uh, bivalves and applying first the strontium isotope method to see if we could, in the interval of the boundary, so in the Galila formation, uh, determine more precisely where, where exactly the boundary is. And on this curve, you can see that we plot his uh, four values for strontium isotopes, so for those four shells that were well preserved, versus the curve of strontium isotope across the Triassic-Jurassic. And you immediately see one problem. 
The problem is that this curve, because we have a peak and then a trough, is non-unique. So for each one of our values, we have two potential um, ages that we could derive. So either it could be slightly older or either it could be slightly younger. And unfortunately, these ages straddle the boundary. So that's the case for this example, but it's also, of course also the case for the younger example. So we do get a better age, but it's not perfect. This would be much more useful if we paired it with something else. So what we did is we also measured the carbon isotope, the Del-C13 of micrite, the, the mud within these, uh, the, these uh, carbonates. And that Del-C13 of the micrite, you can see is very interesting because we have four sections here throughout the region. So Martin worked on multiple sections. And the pattern in carbon isotope, the pattern is very similar. So we recognize this peak, for instance, but we also recognize this big trough. And that broad pattern can really be seen everywhere. So can we actually use that pattern to say something about the age? And the answer to this question lies in trying to correlate the carbon isotope with the indication that we have, the relative constraint on age from strontium isotope, to other sections somewhere else that were well dated. And of course, that's exactly what we did. So here you can see on the very right, we have our Musandan Peninsula data set. So that's all the section combined together for, in, and we use the carbon isotope to do this correlation. And notice this trough here, followed by a big peak in carbon isotope and followed by another trough in carbon isotope. And what's really interesting is that one of the best Triassic to Jurassic section is actually uh, St. Audrey's Bay in the UK because it's a it's a neritic hemipelagic section so it has really good biostratigraphy and it's well dated and you can see in gray we have the Triassic to Jurassic boundary so the the, the boundary between the Raytheon and the Hittangian and we recognize the two troughs that we've seen with um, in the Musandan, we also recognize them in the St. Andrews Bay. So by combining this indication from the carbon isotope with our strontium isotope indication, we can actually recognize where the Racian and Etangian are and where the boundary should be in our Musandan section. We narrow this down to a mere 50 meters thanks to our work. And some of those peaks can also be recognized in other sections, in Italy and even in Canada. So you can see how useful carbon isotopes paired with strontium isotope and sometimes paired with oxygen isotope can be. So that's really the key here is to be able to use chemostratigraphy paired with biostratigraphy and in particular use multiple methods in chemostratigraphy, so multiproxy to constrain time units. Which methods you use exactly depend on the nature of your sediments. Some method will work well in one section and poorly in another section and vice versa. So you need to know your, your sediments. There is no unique answer to this question. So in the next lecture, we're gonna move away a little bit from stratigraphy and we're gonna focus on carbonate sedimentology because this is going to be useful when we look at sequence stratigraphy later in the course.